Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, this is the first of this year's Knowledge by the Slice uh, lunchtime lectures. I'm Lorraine Terrell. I'm the Director for Communications for the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, this is our second year of sponsoring the Knowledge by the Slice series. Um, we're happy to have this opportunity to highlight uh, the work of our great faculty for the broader campus community uh, and do it in a context that's outside the classroom. Um, today's speaker is Associate Professor of Sociology Jason Schnicker. Professor Schnicker's work uh, focuses on the sociology of health, including social conditions related to health and health policy research. Um, his teaching includes classes on medical sociology and the sociology of mental illness. Um, some of his recent published papers have addressed topics like how Americans' beliefs about causes and treatments of mental illness has evolved. Um, and another topic that he's done, <clears throat> excuse me, a great deal of research on are health effects, health issues in the uh, large and growing prison population. Um, his talk today is on the effects of incarceration on mental and physical health. Um, I'm going to ask you to please welcome Professor Schnicker. And also, it looks like our pizza has just arrived, but rather than um, delay the start of the talk, I'm just hoping people can kind of like line up quietly and listen uh, while we begin the talk. Thanks, and enjoy the lunch and the lecture. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And so don't be shy. Um, I can tell you, undergrads, as you get older, a free pizza really never loses its appeal. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here. And if you're interested in the pizza, please go up and, and, and grab some. Um, today I'm going to give you a sense of a larger project on the effects of incarceration on physical and mental health. This involves a lot of collaborators and a lot of different elements to it. Um, and so you're going to see a variety of different dimensions of this, of this, of this topic. I hope to end with some thoughts about the policy implications of our results. The first thing, though, I want to emphasize is something some of you are probably aware of, but perhaps not all of you, that the incarceration rate in the United States has been growing, and it's been growing a lot. So if you want to think about the determinants of the health of Americans, incarceration, while uncommon, is a lot more common than it used to be. This is the growth of people on paper. And so we're considering in this figure people who are incarcerated, also people who have had other forms of contact with the criminal justice system. This is 1980, and this is 2009. In the next slide, I'm going to expand the x-axis a little bit so you'll see how unusual some of these recent trends are. But this is the increase over time. So in 2009, we had over 7 million Americans on paper in one way or another. A large fraction, about 11% were on patrol, 21% were in prison, 11% were in jail, so were local facilities, and about 58% were on probation. So a large number of Americans have contact with the criminal justice system. If you think about this in a different way, if you think about people who are currently incarcerated, but also people who have had uh, experience with incarceration in their past, the numbers are even larger. So ultimately in this project, we're interested not so much or not only in the effects of health for current inmates, but what happens if you have spent time in prison in the past. And that's a large fraction of Americans. From 1948 to the mid-1970s, our incarceration rate in the United States was more or less stable. It fluctuated a little bit. Um, there wasn't a lot of change. In the blue, we have uh, current prisoners, and in the red, we have former prisoners. So people who are not in prison but have it on the record. And it's more or less stable, but starting in the 1970s, mid-1970s, you get this large takeoff, both in the current prisoners and former prisoners. These folks will eventually be released, and so the average sentence is a little over two years. So this is a pretty dynamic population. This population, of course, is going to continue to grow but you're looking at nearly 8 million people in the United States with some experience in prison, either currently or in their, in their past. There's also a geographic component to this. And so in some of our analyses, we're interested in the effects of state, rate, uh, state incarceration rates on the health of people within that state. And there's a lot of variation, some of which you're probably familiar with. So in Texas, they incarcerate a lot of people. In Florida, they incarcerate a lot of people. I'm going to show you some of the trends. This are ex-felons as a percent of the adult population. So here we're looking at people who have felony convictions. Large fraction of them go to prison or jail. Some of them do not get other sentences, but we're just looking at ex-felons here. So we're looking at a percentage here of five to just under zero, uh, 0.5, excuse me, to just under about 5%. There's some regional variation, things you're familiar with. So Texas, California, and Florida. But if you look at 2010, notice how its scale has shifted here. So we're looking at upwards of 
uh, people within those states have some sort of a felon con uh, felony conviction. So these are ex-felons. And you can see again here, Texas, California, um, Florida, Indiana, and Wyoming. Obviously, the risk of incarceration is not distributed equally throughout the population. This is a very unusual population in some regards. And as you probably know, it's especially common among African Americans. So I'm going to show the same trends um, expressed as a percent of the adult uh, African American population. Notice the scale here. We're looking at 1.5 percent on the lightest to up to about 25 percent of the African American population have a felony conviction. This is 1980, so California, Texas, but you can see there's a lot of variation, and in some states, there's not an awful lot of felony convictions among African Americans within those states. Fast forward to 2010, and you can see the United States has gotten in a very different place. And so now, in some states, the felony rate among African Americans is up to 37% uh, percent by our estimates. And as you can see, it really swept the country. There's a lot of, there's not as much variation between states. Um, in their, their felony conviction rates here. And of course, Texas, California, and Florida are still um, leading the country. You can think about this differently. We are interested in the effects of incarceration, but obviously when people are convicted of a crime, this isn't the only thing we do. And in fact, this has some important policy implications. So for example, if we identify effects of incarceration, one implication, negative effects, one implication is we should perhaps give alternative sentences. And one of the alternatives is community supervision recognize that states allocate their convicted populations in different ways, if you want to think about it. This is the incarceration rate. And obviously, if you're thinking geographically, you recognize that these boundaries are distorted. They're distorted on the base of the population size. So Texas, it's not really that big. It's big, but it's not that big. Um, this is their incarceration rate. And this is the percent of adults under community supervision. These two maps are not identical. And in fact, there's some important variation between states which is important for our analysis. So for example, I'll point you to Minnesota, which is where one of my collaborators works. Minnesota does not imprison a lot of people. However, Minnesota puts enormous number of people under community supervision. So states have different policies. Texas does both things, as it turns out. States have different policies for what they do with um, their convicted population. And this is going to be uh, relevant for our analysis. If you want to put this in an international perspective, um, the United States is a clear uh, outlier. So the incarceration rate in the United States is very high, and in fact, internationally, it looks even higher still. And so here's from 2003, from a famous article. This is the United States incarceration rate per 100,000 members of the population. The U.S. exceeds the incarceration rate in Russia, in South Africa, and every other country by a wide uh, margin. And so the U.S. is a real outlier in the number of people it's putting behind, uh, behind bars. So here's our current figures. And the reason I'm going into some detail about this is just to impress upon you that if you're thinking about social risk factors, and I know some undergrads are thinking along these lines, especially if you're in my med social class, if you're thinking about the, no the number of people who are affected by this, it's quite large. And if you think there's any sort of spillover effects to the community, it's even larger still. And I'll make an argument for that here in a second. But currently, we have 2.5 million people on prison parole. It's 2% of adult males, 5% of black adult males. Former prisoners, we have 5.1 million. For a total, and these are prisoners. These are not just people who have a conviction. These are people who have spent time in prison. 7.6 million people, so it's 3.3% of the adult population, 6.2% of adult males, and 15.4% um, of African American uh, males. Large numbers. We're interested in studying in our project, and I'll use we here, but in the effects of incarceration on health. And we're interested primarily, and I'm going to show you results in the short term here about this, on the effects of the individual, that is, people who have been sent to prison or jail. However, we don't envision this is the only effect, because it turns out that a lot of the men who are sentenced to prison are fathers, and in fact, most of them are fathers. So you can envision there's some effect, perhaps, on the child, and there's some effects on the mother. And we're going to see if the, if the two effects are the same thing. Um, so we have a variety of micro-level data. We're going to look at morbidity, mortality, some family-level data. We also have macro-level data, which we're looking at now. So we have states, and we have their incarceration rate. We have estimates of the number of former inmates within those states. And we have indicators of different health outcomes within those states, including HIV. And so we're exploiting that information to look at whether there are effects of the incarceration on states. 
So the first thing you're probably thinking is I'm promising effects. I'm not promising associations. We're not talking correlations. I'm envisioning some sort of a causal analysis. There's a lot of challenges. And the first challenge is finding former inmates. It turns out it's very easy, of course, to find current inmates. And we keep very good records of them for, for a good reason. But when it comes to former inmates, they're actually difficult to identify in a lot of the social service, uh, excuse me, the survey data that social scientists use. However, it's getting easier. And it's not necessarily getting easier because we want to monitor this population. We want to see what happens to this population. Rather, it's getting easier because survey researchers in the 1980s and 1990s figured out that if you want to do a nationally representative sample of Americans, you are losing or missing a large fraction of males, especially African American males. So a lot of the surveys we use in sociology and other social sciences, they started asking about that to get a better sense of how off their nationally representative data is. So there's a fair amount of, of information. When it comes to estimating the number of former inmates within a state, we have to approximate that. So all those figures I showed you before are based on assumptions and estimations. It's difficult to find uh, these people. It's also difficult to identify effects on health. And the problem here is that the risks of incarceration, those factors that increase your risk of going to prison or jail, committing an offense, and so on, are very similar um, to your risk for poor health. So a childhood background characterized by poverty and abuse, um, low socioeconomic status, and so on. These things are correlated both with your likelihood of going to prison and with um, poor health in adulthood. So there's confounding. There's a lot of confounding. So we're going to try to eliminate, uh, eliminate that. It's also the case that it's difficult, if not impossible, the way we think about it, to identify mechanisms. So I'm going to show you here effects of incarceration. But ultimately, we can't really explain why that happens. We think there's a whole bunch of things going on. That when you're incarcerated, um, you have a hard time finding a job. Your relationships fall apart. There's legal discrimination, if you want to put it that way, against former inmates. They're denied certain rights that other people have. We think all those things add up to a stressful environment, an environment that's not conducive to health. We don't think there's a magic bullet. But in fact, it's very difficult to identify what those mechanisms are. The other thing, and the other complexity here, is that you would think that our perspective is going to be incarceration bad, incarceration bad for your health. And, but in fact, it's much more complicated. And there's a lot of countervailing influences. Think immediately of incarceration itself. So just imagine current inmates. On the one hand, this is severe isolation. The conditions in prisons are difficult. They're often dangerous. So we have television shows devoted to this topic, uh, Oz, for example. So you would imagine that life in prison, difficult. However, it's also the case that in prison, it's the one place you are guaranteed health care as a matter of, of right. So we do not deny inmates uh, health care. For many inmates, this is an improvement in their circumstance. And so they're getting health care for the first time. We can debate whether it's good health care. And there's an enormous amount of variation between states. States are often, obviously, the authority on state facilities. And so states do it differently and allocate their resources differently. But you have access to some health care. You also, when you're checked into a prison, you get an evaluation. You get a physical. So you might figure out what's wrong with you and suddenly get treatment. So from the standpoint of health, it's a little ambiguous whether you think about current incarceration and those countervailing influences and draw a sharp separation between current incarceration and former incarceration. All those negative things I talked about, a lot of those materialize only after you're released. The difficulties of finding a job, keeping your marriage together, finding resources, and so on. So the stigma, the long arm in prison, that's ultimately what we're interested in. A lot of our case is going to rest on. In the short term, though, it's different. And in fact, there's good evidence that when you're in prison, not only does your health improve, but our understanding of health disparities is very different. This figure has a lot going on. Obviously, if you look at the prison population, most of them are men. They're men are more likely than women to be incarcerated. And it's, it's more common among African Americans than it is among whites. I want to alert you to a couple things. These are three different periods here. And we have mortality statistics. The numbers are the expected number of years lost in life expectancy between the ages of 18 and 65. And there's a couple ratios here. One is the white-black ratio, so just focus on race. And the other is the prison US um, ratio. Note here, the first thing to point out, is that in the US, the non-incarcerated population, the mortality rate is actually higher outside of prison 
than inside of prison. So that's why this ratio is less than one, whereas among whites, it's different. So the disparity, the common disparity in mortality that you find in the U.S., excuse me, more generally, it looks very different in prisons than outside of prisons. And so for a lot of African American men, their situation in prison is better than their situation outside of prison. Now what does this mean? This does not mean we should be applauding the performance of prisons. This rather suggests that access to care outside of prisons for this population is very, very limited. However, this suggests that if you want to think about the effects of incarceration, for people who are at especially high risk, at least the time period that they're in prison might have some, um, some benefits for their health. And in fact, this is a result that turns up over and over again. These are vital statistics. This is probably the best evidence we have. But it also turns up in some of our analyses that I'm going to show you. It's also the case that if you look at health care, um, a lot of these guys are doing pretty well. So I'm going to alert you to a couple different things in this figure. These are the prevalence of diagnosed psychiatric conditions and treatments. So we're focusing just on psychiatric conditions, which I'll transition to here in a second. There are federal sta inmates, state inmates, and jail inmates. To an approximation, the quality of services is best here and not as good here. So federal in inmates do the best in terms of the services they get, followed by state inmates, followed by jail inmates. Jail inmates are on local jurisdictions. This is your medication. This is the fraction that have a psychiatric condition. So it's 15%, 25%, and 25% here. This is the fraction that ever took medication for a psychiatric problem. So we're looking at most inmates. Was taking medication at the time of arrest, it suddenly drops from 71 to 25. So when most inmates are arrested, they're not on their medication. However, once they end up in prison, most inmates are back on their psychiatric medication. We can debate the meaning of this, but the fact is that most inmates get the services that they had before once they get back in prison. And the same is true of counseling. Their counseling drops off at the time they're arrested, and once they get back in prison, they find it again. There's a parallel table which looks at physical health conditions, and you find the same thing, that once inmates go to prison, they get services, they get medication, they get exams if they're injured in prison. So the quality of their services, on average, improves when they go um, when they go to prison. Once you leave prison, it's a very different story. And so one of the results that sparked our interest in this was kind of the early salvos. It's an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is something that uh, physicians are aware of as well. It's not just uh, medical sociologists. It's by Ben Zwanger, and it's a study of Washington State. This is the death rate per uh, 100,000 person years, the way to calculate this. And this is the weeks after release. The risk of mortality among released inmates is three and a half times the state average in Washington, and it's especially high one or two weeks after release. So any benefit of incarceration quickly deteriorates as soon as these inmates are released. In this case, um, the leading cause of death are drug overdose. Uh, a lot of uh, men were convicted for a drug offense. They essentially go clean while they're in prison. And they have a hard time redosing themselves when they get out, and so they overdose. It's also things, though, like cardiovascular disease, homicide, and suicide. So the benefits of incarceration quickly deteriorate. We're interested, actually, in this longer arm. So we're interested in why it remains elevated even after um, that two-week period, because the two-week period is especially high, but we're interested in what happens uh, following. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through some of the data. This is a very data-intensive exercise. I could have spent a lot of time talking about data here, but it's, it's kind of boring to do that. I'm going to try to sell this data to you and show you some of its, its key characteristics. The first thing I'm going to show you is the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, and some of you may have heard of this. It's, it's, it turns up in economics, political science, sociology. It's panel data, by which we mean we follow individuals over time, approximately every two years at this point. They have information on incarceration, but it's indirect information, as I mentioned before. The reason we are able to identify people, current and former inmates, is that they started with a population of people who weren't in prison. And then they realized that a lot of these guys were going to prison, and they couldn't do their ordinary household surveys to interview them. So they actually interviewed them in prison. And in the SIT data itself, it shows where they interviewed them, in their home or in a detention facility. So we're able to identify if they're in prison and to an approximation how long they're in prison. There's a lot of observed relevant confounding factors, so we can control for those things. But more importantly, because it's panel data, we're also able statistically, with a little bit of uh, magic, we're able to eliminate fixed characteristics of that individual. So anything that's fixed, anything that's an endowment of that individual, statistically we can wash its effects away. So this means we're just looking at changes. Does a change in your incarceration status lead to a change in your health? 
And it turns out that's very useful for us because we imagine that a lot of the things that contaminate the causal effect of incarceration on health are these fixed characteristics of these individuals. And so we're able to eliminate that statistically. The second one that I'm going to talk about for psychiatric disorders, the National Comorbidity Survey Replication, which is a large data set about psychiatric disorders in the United States, relatively current, 2001, 2003. It has psychiatric uh, diagnostic instrument, the CD, some of you may be familiar with. It also has an indicator of disability, which we use, called the HUDOS. We're able to identify, or we think, get some traction on the effects of incarceration because of information on the age of the onset of that psychiatric disorder. So we can look at whether it was prior to when you were incarcerated as an adult or subsequent to that. And so using that information, we can line things up and see if incarceration itself led to the onset of a disorder. Um, we also have, and you can prove this, a variety of different things that are risk factors for psychiatric disorders, but in fact, they also align to the risk factors for incarceration. So parental maladjustment, interpersonal loss as a child, abuse and neglect as a child, and economic adversity. All these things are correlated with psychiatric disorders. We know that. They're also correlated with the likelihood of going to prison and jail. So we have a lot of leverage on trying to figure out the effects of incarceration. A lot of numbers here. I'm just going to show you walk you through the basic results. The outcome here is morbidity, and it's serious morbidity, uh, disability. That is, you are unable to work or do your normal activities because of a physical health condition. And we're looking at the effects of being currently incarcerated, so a positive value equals worse health. And your incarceration history, whether you're incarcerated one panel, two panels, three panels, or four more. So longer periods of incarceration. And we're controlling for a variety of confounding factors, including your age, schooling. Um, they have intelligence. Some of you know the book, The Bell Curve. This is the data that was used in The Bell Curve. Um, drug use, income, and marital status. And it turns out that currently incarcerated uh, people have better health. Their risks of severe disability are lower. So all these coefficients, consistent with what I talked about before, are negative. It also turns out that the longer you're exposed to prison, the worse your health. So these coefficients are positive and they get bigger in general as you're exposed to more incarceration. The remarkable result here is that the asterisk means it's significant. Across these models, it remains significant even when you start controlling for these things. And in the final model, which is where we use the fixed effects, so we're controlling for all the fixed characteristics of people in this sample. And note, even then, which is really controlling for a lot of things, you get these negative effects of incarceration. Incarceration increases your risk of morbidity, with the exception of people who are doing especially long sentences. For those people, there's something about their experience that led them to have both bad health and a long sentence. So incarceration is not causally related to it. However, because most people are sentenced to relatively short things, most people are experiencing this risk of incarceration. And incarceration does, in fact, cause negative health effects for most people who are transitioning through the uh, prison system. We're also interested in psychiatric outcomes. Now here, it's even <coughs> worse. It's even more difficult. And the problem is, not only do you have this confounding that I talked about, but it's also the case that a lot of people end up in prison because of their psychiatric disorder. So we classify drug abuse as a psychiatric disorder. We classify impulse control problems as psychiatric disorders. And all these things are related to criminality. So if you want to identify the effects of incarceration on psychiatric outcomes, your difficulties are even higher. So you have to control for childhood adversities, for early onset psychiatric disorders, for early onset substance disorders, or often comorbid with, comorbid with these uh, other psychiatric disorders. Look at the effects of incarceration on psychiatric disorders, and in this case, we're also going to look at the effects of disability. So we're not only interested in whether incarceration causes psychiatric disorders, but whether that also explains, perhaps, why former inmates have such a difficult time reintegrating into society. That is, is health, mental health in particular, implicated in their success in transitioning back out of uh, prison. And it turns out, not surprisingly, these are access one disorders here. This is the lifetime prevalence, so ever in your lifetime. This is 12 month or current prevalence. This is no history of incarceration. This is some history of incarceration. This is just descriptive statistics. And it turns out that <coughs> those with a history of incarceration have a worse profile on virtually every psychiatric diagnosis in the data set. So the prevalence in terms of the lifetime and in terms of the 12-month is much higher 
especially, as I was alluding to before, for substance disorders. So a lot of inmates, former inmates, um, suffer from substance abuse disorders, alcohol abuse, alcohol dependence, drug abuse, drug dependence. Impulse control disorders are also highly, pre highly prevalent. But more generally, all these psychiatric disorders are more common among former inmates. It turns out that if you use the statistical models that I talked about before, you control for all these things, childhood background, a lot of these relationships disappear. That is that former inmates have higher levels of psychiatric disorders because they had high, very disadvantaged childhoods. With one exception, there seems to be effects of incarceration on mood disorders in particular. And part of that has to do with the fact that the average age of onset of mood disorders is in your late 20s. So in most cases, these guys did time in their early 20s. And so their mood disorders had an onset subsequent to incarceration. So we can say that under most cases, the relationship between incarceration and psychiatric disorders, it's due to confounding. It's likely spurious. There's no effect, at least as far as we can identify, of, of incarceration on psychiatric disorders, with the exception of mood disorders. And it turns out that is a very important relationship. You might think, well, depression is probably to be expected among former inmates. They have very difficult environments. What's the consequence of having mood disorders, especially given their environments? And it turns out that mood disorders, by our calculations, do a lot to explain their difficulties in reintegrating. So we know this is not a result that's unique to our study, that mood disorders are highly correlated with disability. When people are depressed, they have a hard time in a variety of different things, in their social roles, in their self-care, in their mobility, because it involves somatic symptoms in their ability to think, in their cognition, in their social functioning, and in their social participation, how often they get out and talk with people and so on. So depressed people suffer from very high disability. And it turns out that former inmates have particularly high disability, not unexpected. But if you control for mood disorders, you can explain 39% of their role loss, 44% of their self-care limitations, 32% of their mobility limitations, 88% of cognition uh, disability, 50% of social functioning, and 48% of their social participation disability. So our argument here is that health is important. I'm a medical sociologist, so we talked about in the introduction. I think health itself is an important outcome. But in fact, the debate and the empirical elements of this paper stretch beyond that. So if you're interested in trying to reintegrate inmates, which a lot of people are, provide them with services, their health has to be an important consideration. And we think their mental health, in particular mood disorders, are an especially important consideration. And it might not be something people are thinking about if they're thinking former inmates need drug treatment or uh, impulse control problems. Mood disorder is not likely on the table, but it seems to be implicated a great deal in the disability that they're experiencing. Okay, so inmates aren't the only people who are affected by incarceration. Families are affected. And it's, if you consider families as the unit of analysis, you have a different set of considerations. So in another data set, this is a picture of an inmate reading a story um, to his child, and so it's recorded and it's delivered to him. More than half of inmates are parents. So these are young men, and they're in the early part of their family life. And most of the children of inmates are under the age of 10. So we're bringing that up because these are times when kids need a lot of attention, and mothers are delivering a lot of that attention. So Part of the problem here is that you're incarcerating men who may or may not have been involved with their children. Most of the evidence suggests that they were involved to some degree. And when they're incarcerated, mothers are left behind. So we're also interested in their experiences, not only in their experience raising their child, but also in terms of their mental health. And so in our analyses, we find that having a father who's incarcerated increases the odds of major depression among mothers by approximately 30%. So the effects that we documented on mood disorders for the person who was incarcerated are approximated to a degree in the mothers they leave behind. Now, this is in some ways a remarkable result because you could imagine some of these mothers are involved with guys who, well, they committed an offense, they're convicted of a crime. You could debate whether they are good fathers or not. Some of them provided money, some of them did not provide money. We have information on that. You control for all that information. These mothers are still affected by the fact that these men are going to prison. And a large part of that effect we're able to show 
is explainable by parenting stress. How much difficulty they have raising their child. So we're harming families and we're also harming the health of these mothers. Now, the health of the child might be affected as well. We have yet to do those analyses, but we think it's shocking to some degree that the effects are very parallel between mothers and fathers. So, in our account, the stigma of incarceration is very high and it perhaps also affects mothers as well. So we're putting scare quotes around contagious. That's a good thing to do. But we think that the stigma of incarceration is to some degree contagious um, to the people associated with uh, the former inmate. And in fact, we can measure the stigma associated with incarceration. So in one of our data sets, they ask people, everybody in the data set, where they stand in American society and where they stand in their community. And they don't just ask it that way, they ask uh, vocally. They present them a picture. In this picture, they say at the top of the ladder are people who are the best off and at the, uh, um, those who have the most money, the most education, the most respected job. At the bottom are the people who are the worst off, who have the least money, the least education, the least respected jobs. And they ask people to put an X on the rung that corresponds to their position in the U.S. and their position in the community. And this is the frequency distribution for the U.S., which is the blue, and for your community. It turns out people report, and this is perhaps not surprising, that their standing in the community is higher than their standing in the U.S. in general. So they're comparing themselves to different groups. But most Americans think they're probably above average in terms of their standing in the community. This is the Lake Wobegon effect. And they're even higher still in terms of their standing in the community. Now I'm showing this frequency distribution, this is for the U.S. as a whole, to show that it's very difficult for people to put themselves below the midpoint. People don't want to do that. Nobody wants to think of themselves as average, certainly, and definitely not below average. With the exception of, you know where I'm going with this, uh, former inmates. The stigma attached to incarceration, I want to impress upon you, is very, very high. So there's a lot of discussion about the meaning of incarceration within certain communities, especially uh, poor African American communities, that maybe it's a rite of passage, it's seen in a positive way. But from all the evidence we've gathered, that's really not the case, and the stigma is quite high. So here we have the average, and we're focusing just on men here, in the U.S. for men and in the community. This is your contact with the criminal justice system. So here we have, there's no crime for which you could have been arrested, so you're squeaky clean. There's a crime but no arrest. There's arrest but no incarceration. There's incarceration of a short period of time, less than a month, and incarceration of a long period of time, more than a month. And as you can see, as your contact with the criminal justice system increases, your standing, your status, your self-reported status declines to the lowest level, which is 4.89. And it's a little bit higher in your community, but it's still quite low. It's here, it's 5.58. And we can compare that with other stigmatized groups. So the homeless, those with the learning disability, physical disability, psychiatric ho those who are in a psychiatric hospital, those people who are not citizens, the unemployed, those who are on welfare, the obese, and the physically abused in, in childhood. And relative to all these groups, former inmates, with the exception of whether you're homeless, and a lot of these people are the same people, um, it's very, very low, right? Below that midpoint. And so relative to other stigmatized status, the stigma of incarceration is a bit higher. Now, you could argue that, well, it's not zero, um, so they do retain some sense of their own dignity, that's true, but it's quite low, um, mm -hmm. both for the U.S. and for the community. Um, in fact, the only comparison here is with those who have been homeless. And in fact, those most likely to be affected by incarceration, that is African American men, the drop in your status <coughs> is sharper than it is for white men. One of the arguments is that in the African American community, it doesn't have the same stigma because it's so common. This is a basic kind of statistical argument. When things are common, they can't be stigmatizing because they're not distinguishing. But it turns out that if you look at, this is African Americans and this is men, these are coefficients which show the departure from the average associated with amounts of contact with the criminal justice system. So crime, no arrest, arrest, no incarceration, incarceration less than a month, and incarceration more than one month. So compare here to here and here to here. And as you can see, in each of these cases, the drop in status for African Americans is actually much larger than the drop in status for white inmates. It's not, I see it's controlled for education and age, but not for social class. It does not control for social class. We do not control for social class 
because if there's any effective incarceration on your social class, we think that's over, over controlling. But we're going to do that in subsequent analyses. So we did some stuff where we control for childhood background, confounding things, but things we might imagine that are effects of incarceration we don't control for. So these are very reduced forms, reduced form models. But the effects of incarceration on status across these different specifications seem to be worse for African Americans. So don't imagine that as the prevalence goes up, the stigma goes down. That does not seem to be the case. So th these are the basic conclusions, and I'll open up uh, for, for discussion. We think incarceration is significant. We think it contributes to health. Um, we also think it contributes to health disparities. However, in our analyses, it contributes only a little to explaining overall race differences in the United States. And the reason that's the case is because the African American population is subject to a variety of risk factors, including incarceration, but certainly not limited to incarceration. So the fraction of variance that we're able to explain in health due to incarceration is actually very small. Um, now, that doesn't mean incarceration is irrelevant or this trend is race neutral. That's certainly not the case. Um, but we think its contributions to disparities, per se, are quite uh, are limited. We also think it contributes enormously to disability and in ways that people aren't necessarily thinking about. Thinking about mood disorders as something that we should treat and take seriously in the former inmate population, if only because it allows them to reintegrate into society a little bit better than would be apparent um, otherwise. I will say that former inmates do, under some circumstances, get a lot of good things, especially in Philadelphia, as it turns out. There's a lot of good social service organizations. But most of those organizations are focusing on other psychiatric conditions. They're not focusing on depression. They're focusing on things like substance abuse, and for good reason in many cases. They're th thinking about impulse control disorders, and for good reasons. Mood disorders are more or less an afterthought. But if you think about disability, mood disorders are more strongly associated with disability than those other things. And so we need to focus on that in particular, we think, um, if you want to understand who reintegrates better and, and who, do, who does not. There are some policy considerations that we're thinking through. Um, there are alternatives to incarceration. And so if the effects of incarceration are about incarceration per se, we can think about other things to do with these men. And in the case of Minnesota that I alluded to before, they incarcerate very few people. They put a lot of people in community supervision. Our preliminary analyses suggest, with respect to HIV AIDS, that the incarceration rate increases the prevalence of HIV AIDS. However, the community supervision rate does not increase the prevalence of HIV AIDS, which suggests that even if you don't want to close the door on the criminal justice system, which is perfectly reasonable, community supervision is an alternative that might blunt some of these negative um, effects of health, especially in the long term, although that's, that's preliminary and there's a lot of complications there. It's also the case that we can think about this as reducing the number of former inmates, and certainly there's movement towards that. And in fact, the movement towards reducing the number of inmates is much higher now than it was two years ago. And it's a strictly economic sort of argument. So think California. California incarcerates a lot of people. They spend a lot of money doing so. They're trying to roll people out of that system in part because it's going to save them a lot of money. So in the foul weather we have now, there's a lot of political traction on the idea that we should reduce the inmate population. A lot of it's rerouted in uh, economics. However, we don't think that's the only problem, and that if we think about what happens when these guys are released, we need to take seriously the idea that incarceration is having lingering consequences for their health. And we can think about this in a variety of different ways. One is that their sentence is, in fact, too long. They're there for two years, but they bear the brunt of the consequences in terms of their health for much longer. This could be, by some definitions, cruel and unusual. We think he also just means that we need to think seriously about reintegration services and health services for these guys for a variety of reasons, to improve their health, but also to improve their ability to, to reintegrate into society. Um, so those are our basic results. I'm happy to entertain uh, questions and your thoughts um, on this uh, complicated issue. I think it's a variety of different things. Um, you know, the kind of ankle bracelet thing, uh, house arrest, um, people who have uh, work release programs. It's anything that's in the in the community and not uh, in the in the prison system. It's an uh, alternative to that. It's a long question. I'm sorry about that. But there's no way to make it too short. 
are, is this program of research going to continue to look at not white, not black populations broken down into all the constituent groups that are in, in an incarcerated situation? And I want to be rather explicit. Asians, as a group, native populations of one kind or another that vary between the lower 48 states and what one might find in Alaska, which is a particularly unusual state because of the native populations. Uh, and there is a group, it's small, they have some unusual characteristics. Samoans experience certain things that make them a rather individual group. So I didn't know how broadly you're going to do a demography. Okay, so there's a couple different issues. So he's, he's, he's asking whether I should consider other racial and ethnic groups in the same detail that I'm considering African Americans and whites. And there's a couple different issues. One, um, in any kind of national level survey, and you're looking at the incarcerated population, black and white give us the larger numbers. Some of these other groups, they're so small that we can't say anything with much, much, much confidence. However, I will say in the family analyses that we've done, we've made Hispanics a, a topic of our, our research because the incarceration rate is high among Hispanics, especially high now in part because people, there are immigration issues involved and so people are getting incarcerated and detained on that basis. So it, it introduces a unique uh, set of issues. So some, so some of it's about our confidence in speaking to these groups. We're interested in understanding to the best of our ability given the limited data. There's also the case that we've explored race and ethnic differences in the effects of incarceration. So all these effects that I showed you are average effects. You could imagine that the effects are larger for African Americans or smaller for African Americans, that they differ between racial and ethnic groups. And so we find in our analyses almost no evidence for racial and ethnic differences in the effects of incarceration. The effect of incarceration seems to be similar for African Americans and for whites. Now, of course, African Americans, much more common experience. And so the, the, the risk fraction, the, the, the amount of damage is causing it's much higher. But there doesn't seem to be too many racial differences. And we've done that also with Hispanics. The other groups you mentioned, we just, I mean, one or two people, we're not able to do anything. Just one quick follow-up. And you mentioned citizenship, which for Latino, Hispanic people is a much more complicated, because most of the black people, and most of the white people, most of the other people are citizens by virtue of their, they were born here, right. and we're with the Hispanics. You do get a very divergent group yeah. of people where there is a lot of illegality and that could have some very serious ramifications for certain aspects of your study. Absolutely. And, and actually, some of the, the groups, the immigrant groups who are arrested, we're never going to observe because they're deported. Um, and so this is a US, uh, US sample, so we don't, I mean, we, uh, we send them all over the world now. Um, and so we don't follow them. So it's, 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 it's a complicated issue. Immigration, by the way, is up for all these groups. So that, you know, there's African immigrants in here as well. So. <clears throat> It's not only a lack of those things, it's, it's become, it's declined. You know, so there's fewer of those things now than there were in, in the past. And my reading of it is it's almost entirely budgetary. You know, there's so many, in their capacity, there, there's so many guys behind bars, they're crowded into small spaces, they're doing everything, putting all their resources to controlling the population, not so much to educating the population. Um, we think that's a, that's a loss. Um, that if you can develop some human capital when you're in prison, your profile, your, uh, your outcomes are a little bit, are better um, than they would be otherwise. Um, and you could put some health promotion activities on the table, we think, and that would be useful, but it's become tricky. And again, I think a lot of it, this is just this, the financing of, of prisons has, has shifted in ways that are detrimental to, to inmates. Well, these, these two things are related. So the psychiatric, the closing of psychiatric hospitals and the run-up uh, in, in incarceration. The run-up incarceration is due to a variety of different things, but the, the bottom line is we've just been incarcerating more people for a variety of different offenses. You're just more likely, all is being equal, given your offense, to go, to go to prison. But these two things are related. So that a lot of the psychiatric hospitals and incarceration. So people are released from psychiatric hospitals. They often end up in jails, and they often end up in prisons, and they end up there because people don't, 
the beat cops don't know what to do with them. They're acting, uh, they're acting uh, in a dangerous fashion or a seemingly dangerous fashion. They don't know what to do with them, so they end up in, in, in jails and occasionally in, in prison. So the forces of selection that we're dealing with, just in terms of our narrow question of identifying the causal effects, are made even more difficult by virtue of, of, of that fact. We get people who are once in a psychiatric hospital moving to uh, uh, a prison system. Absolutely. So, so the, the first thing is we don't know what institutions these guys came from. So we, don't, we can't identify the effects of private prisons, public prisons, or any condition of these prisons, how they organize. So we don't, we don't know that, unfortunately, and that's a loss. So we do consider women in this analysis. The incarceration rate is up for women, too. In fact, that's the fastest growing population in prisons. And so it depends. In some of our analyses, we actually include women, and we look for sex differences. And we often don't find them. When we looked at mortality, however, we found higher mortality among women who are in prison than men who are in prison. Now, the problem there is that a large fraction of the women who are in prison or jail for a short period of time are involved in the, the sex industry. Infectious diseases, disease is particularly high. Um, and so identifying the effects of incarceration, we think they're there. It's harder to do. Uh, but we've made a point, actually, of including women in the, in the sample. I think a lot of researchers just look at men. It makes it a little easier for them. But we've made a point of including women because they, too, are incarcerated. Um, how do veterans uh, figure into homeless Yeah, we haven't looked at that. Um, we've looked at homelessness. Homeless veterans. How do homeless veterans in here uh, figure into our, our sample? We've looked at the, the homeless uh, issue. And of course, there's a lot of homeless people end up in jail for short periods of time, sometimes long periods of time. <coughs> Substance abuse is very common. Psychiatric disorders are very common in the homeless population. We haven't looked at veterans in, in, in particular, in part because a lot of our data are based on guys who did prison sentences in the 80s and 90s. We're interested in long-term effects. And I think that trend is, is too recent to identify any Anything we'd be confident in. You spoke and showed a graphic about uh, the kind of causal chain of uh, incarceration's effect on health, and then that that's effect on socioeconomic status and outcomes. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious about, I guess, the effect of incarceration on kind of socioeconomic punishments that follow being incarcerated in terms of employment discrimination. Yeah. Being unable to get food stamps in lots of states, yes, depending sir. on your conviction, uh, housing, housing. discrimination. So, um, if there's anything you have to say about the effect of those kind of post-incarceration socioeconomic punishments on health outcomes. Yeah. So. Um I mentioned earlier they have a difficult time identifying mechanisms. And our difficulty is not in that we're not able to control for some of these things, is that there's so many of these issues involved. And so it's housing, it's food stamps, it's your job. If you find a job, it's often off the books. If you find a job, it usually doesn't have health insurance. It's a problem for Americans more generally, but especially for, for inmates. There's very good literatures out there on identifying the effects of incarceration on these things. The effects of incarceration on wages, for example, is a very, it's a controversial topic. My reading of the evidence from uh, quasi-experimental settings and so on is it, it's, it has negative consequences for wages. We know income is related to health. We think that's one of the things contributing to it. We think it's a whole variety of different things. And the reason we emphasize that is because it's not going to be any one thing that eliminates the effects of incarceration altogether. It's not as if we provided them with health care alone that that's going to resolve their problems. Because all the things that you just listed, and there's more, um, contribute something to that. And we think it's that package of things that, that matters. There's a, a book making a lot of waves uh, called the, the New Jim Crow by yeah. Michelle Alexander. Right. I yeah. was wondering if you've looked at her data and had a comment on uh, her conclusions. It's in my Amazon queue. And it is not on my desk, <laughs> so I haven't bought it yet. But uh, it's, it's getting the reviews. And um, there's a lot of books on, on, on the consequences of the racial implications of this. The idea that, that the war on drugs is part of a natural policy to control minority, uh, is, that, is that basically the thesis that she makes? Or is that 
I, I think, um, you know, I haven't read it, so I don't want to say, uh, say too much, but that is an argument other people have made as well. And, and part of the run-up in the 1980s and 90s I was talking about was the war on drugs. And part of that was they had drug sweeps, and part of that they started convicting people for drugs. That's not the only offense uh, involved here. In fact, the incarceration rate for a variety of offenses went up. So it's a heterogeneous group. Um, uh, but that's certainly part of it, and people have argued that that has some racial dimensions. So we, we incarcerate more for crack than we do for cocaine, and, and there's a lot of issues involved, and that's certainly an argument that's been, that's been made. Has there been any uh, study of the effects of the mother's incarceration on the father and the child? Not to my knowledge, in part because it's just so asymmetric. Um, you know, women are incarcerated. As we mentioned, there, the incarceration rate is just much, much lower um, on women. We have a very hard time finding any incarcerated women. So I talked about the sex differences, but we're talking very, very small numbers. I think it's important to keep women on the table and think about their unique experiences in the prison criminal justice system, but the issue you're talking about there, I, I'm not aware of any state that's done that. Um, what is your understanding of uh, your formulation of why incarceration rate is more than triple since the 1970s? Well, so my formulation is the formulation other people have given. There's been a lot of talk about what's going on here. So some of the arguments are okay, there's been some demographic shifts. Um, there's been the war on drugs as a particular mechanism. Um, compositional shifts, the aging of the baby boom generation. Um, people have done decompositions. And my reading of that literature is that the incarceration rate has gone up simply because we're more punitive for a variety of different offenses. So take the same offense drug offense, violent offense, um, you know, larceny, and we are incarcerating more convicted people, convicted of people convicted of those crimes today than we did in the past. So the incarceration rate for a variety of offenses has gone up. So we've just gotten much more punitive um, than we were in the past. It's not as if, uh, you know, the, the, there's a question about what it's done to the crime rate and how those things operate. But I think, and there's some controversy there, but I think the general story is that we've just become more punitive across the board. I should note that the politics of this are interesting. Um, some of you know that Jim Webb has been involved with criminal justice reform. And it's an issue that spans parties. So you shouldn't think that the only people who are interested in rolling back the prison population are left-leaning or Democrat. In fact, that's not the case, um, in part because it has these economic implications. So if you're interested in cutting states' budgets and cutting the federal budget, one way to do that is, is through the prison system. So the politics of this are, are they're spanning the, spanning the spectrum. They're obviously looking at it in different ways, but it's, it's spanning the spectrum. Where do you link? I mean, where do you go from research to remedy? I wish I had a remedy. That'd be nice. Um, my, uh, my collaborator is much more involved with the kind of policy dimensions. And at the moment, we're not quite clear what the policy dimensions are, in part because we're trying to figure out what it is about incarceration that matters. Are there alternatives to incarceration that have fewer health consequences? Are there programs that can break the link between incarceration and what follows? So in some ways, the fact that we have an incarceration system that does pretty well for delivering health services to that population, that's a good thing. But there's such a sharp discontinuity between your time in prison and when you're when you're released, that we're not quite sure what to do there. So here you have one institution. You can supervise everybody in that prison. There are levers you can pull. Once you're released from prison, it's unclear just what levers you can actually pull. So we have probation and parole system. We have parole officers. They're involved. Um, but then you find inmates who are in the kind of safety net and the other institutions, other programs involved. And so it's not quite clear um, what you need to do. So most of our effort is focused on Let's take a person, they're convicted of a crime, what alternative punishments do we have? Are they equivalent from the standpoint of, of justice? And does one have fewer health implications? And we would obviously prefer the one with fewer health implications. Would, would one uh, simple measure be the release of aging prisoners out of the prisons to one segment of the population? Save money that well, most aging prisoners are going to be aging there for a long, long time. So that would be tantamount to releasing them 
as a whole. Those prisoners are getting health care services. I'm actually, we're more concerned, they're an issue too, but we're more concerned about the, the young men who are really coming through the system at very young ages. They, they have some health problems, but it's probably going to get worse. Um, and so that's the age we're going to focus on. They're there for two years, they go out, and what happens to them then? Aging prisoners is a little bit, little bit different. It's a very young population. Um, so that's interesting. I mean, there's, there's, there's urban rural differences. Uh, we haven't looked at those. You should know that um, when people are incarcerated, if you commit a crime in Philadelphia, you're committed for a crime, it's not clear you're going to do your sentence around Philadelphia. It's not even clear you're going to do your sentence in the state of Pennsylvania. So these guys, are, they move around to a variety of different places. We've thought about this in the context of the consequences for families. The idea being that if the father is closer to home, it's cheaper to maintain contact with them, and it's much easier, and you're more likely to sustain the, the family under those circumstances. But given overpopulation, people are moving in all sorts of different places, and we think the further you go away, it's going to have more, more consequences. Obviously, when these guys come back, they're going to think about where they're going to move. A lot of them are coming back to Philadelphia. Um, but it's important to think about that. It's also important to note that incarceration, the, the population of former inmates is very highly segregated. So they're moving back to a relatively small number of communities. So we can also think not only effects on families, but the effects on communities as a whole. And that's something we're dealing with at a speculative level now, but we have data on the functioning of the healthcare system within communities, within states. And one of our intuitions is that just like you have spillover effects for high community on insurance, when you have former inmates, you have people who have a higher need for health services, a diminished capacity to pay for them, and virtually no health insurance. They get services. They will get services. They will go to the emergency room. That cost needs to be shifted onto somebody else. This, context, this has been made in the context of uninsurance, but we think the context of incarceration is especially, might be especially damaging. So we're looking at the relationship between community incarceration rates and the functioning of their health care system. And we think there might be some spillovers. It's hard to argue that at an empirical level. Um, but we think, in principle, it could, there could be something there. There's more pizza. <laughs> there's, there's a question. Well, I think any support they can get is good support, and I applaud the efforts of any organization. But there are a lot of secular organizations that provide very good services, a lot of very old, mature, and effective ones. Um, I don't think religion per se, I don't know the literature, but I don't think it adds additional value, perhaps, but to motivation for the volunteers. But I think any, any sort of safety net that's provided to former inmates is greatly appreciated. I've answered all your questions. Okay, terrific. Thank you.